but uh, you, at UT Austin, uh, working with Steve Grant, I guess. And, and ever since, he's been interested in developing global models of the mantle for different applications, one being more of the programmatic um, kind of viewpoint at Livermore with, uh, to get uh, accurate wave propagation for source uh, studies and in particular, um, you know, the test ban treaty kind of stuff. And then the other one is because of true interest in the deep structure of the earth and the dynamics. And he's been you know, combining with other um, geophysical data for basically improving our knowledge of the structure of the land. He's going to talk to us about some of the um, global tomography. <coughs> We've heard some some aspects, but only, I think, on the uppermost part and more regional. So now we'll hear the global story. Well, yeah, uh, thank you, everybody, for having me. It's a great honor to be here again. It's been a while, maybe six or seven years or so. So it's great to be back. Um, today I'll be talking about the spiral model and the next phase of global tomography uh, at Livermore. And it's a little forward looking uh, to what we're going to be doing next. Um, but I'm also going to give you a, a little bit of a preview. If the screen will advance. Common problem, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so if, on, if you click on the, the PowerPoint presentation and then try again, I think. Oh, okay. There we go. All right. Um, yeah, so um, we use global seismic models and develop them for seismic event monitoring. And, uh, myself and, and Artie and others uh, work for the ground based nuclear detonation detection program, at least in part, me almost entirely. Um, and our job is to perform, perform research at Livermore uh, to support nuclear explosion monitoring uh, research. And of course, it's part of the Department of Energy and the uh, National Nuclear Security Administration. <coughs> um, and the question I often get is what, why global tomography? I'm interested in studying particular regions that might have in, events of, of interest. Why are we doing global? And that's because we want to predict observables from seismic events that occur anywhere. And we also want to create a uh, good starting point for more refined studies for uh, details of interest and make the coming of interest. Um, our initial focus and, and purpose for developing these models uh, was for travel time prediction and that's for location. Uh, we've demonstrated this, uh, I guess it's uh, 2015 in a paper that we can actually reduce the um, travel or the uh, Location this is down to about four or five kilometers in well covered regions around uh, uh, Eurasia and North America, mostly where we have a lot of data. So we get down to four or five kilometers with a global model. So we've, we've demonstrated that it works, and, and uh, that's the primary purpose uh, to begin with. Uh, we have a new emphasis now on full waveform prediction and accurate travel time prediction within a single model. So we want to do event location, uh, uh, moment tensor inversion with 3D models with a single model, that's self-consistent and predict all of these things. That's a long-term goal. Um, I'll get back to that simulation in, in a little bit. So we've been developing models at, at Livermore uh, for quite a long time on, on a global scale. Uh, the, the first one began with the gypsum model, which, which it was a, a joint seismic geodynamic model. Um, and then we progressed through, went to P-Wave models with detail, regional scale details. And then we moved on to uh, uh, joint PNS models, again, with regional scale details. And, uh, and, and, and finally, we, we've gotten to this model called Spiral that uh, many of you have, have heard of, which is joint body and surface wave uh, model. So it's travel time based, uh, multi slash high resolution. It has anisotropy and uh, it's our most recent state of the art. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So the data that go into this model 
It is about 4.2 million uh, travel time arrivals, about 28,000 events or so. Uh, we include cross school regional land teleseismic phases, uh, PEPN, are very important to us. But uh, you know, again, this happens cross school phases, regional phases, out to dis distance between one degree and 180 degrees. So a lot of phases. Um, we also included in this model surface wave uh, velocities. And uh, instead of going to data, we went to dispersion maps uh, based on the Mall and Masters works, uh, which was um, uh, uh, done at, at Scripps. And this, this include maps of uh, Love, Rayleigh, uh, group and phase velocities between 25 and 200 seconds. I've got those listed there in a little bit more uh, uh, descriptive way. And so they produced 45 maps in total uh, with one degree grid spacing. So these are our surface weight constraints that went into spiral. And I'm just showing a couple of, exam of examples there on the night. <clears throat> so uh, the spiral parameterization is just based on a spherical tessellation grid in the lateral sense. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen these. Um, and you can take the, the initial object, break it down, and, and and perform the tessellation and go down to finer and finer scales and with an even uh, set of nodes around the earth. Uh, so we, that's, that's the basic parameterization in the lateral sense. We go down to one degree spacing in the upper mantle, two degree spacing in the lower mantle, and one degree is like a level seven tessellation, so seven tessellations. Uh, but I've also highlighted some polygons here on the map below the tessellation grids. In the green, we take the resolution level down to half a degree, and in the uh, magenta, we take it down to a quarter of a degree. Um, so even though we use a spherical tessellation grid, the model is not spherical at all anywhere. It has built-in mantle stretching, undulations, and the full cross. So these are the same crust units that are in crust 1.0, so seven layers, hard rock, uh, directly built in. And, uh, Again, uh, a, a spherical model. Uh, there's 59 surfaces. We take the high resolution uh, zones only down to about 150 kilometers. Uh, so, uh, so only the shallow or the mantle or crust. And, uh, and so there's about uh, 2.1 million nodes in the model. So 2.1 million uh, spatial nodes. Um, but also importantly, we, we included VTI or vertical transverse isotopy variations in 3D. Uh, we allow it to change everywhere in the mantle, cross as well, even though, of course, as you get deeper, nothing really happens uh, in terms of the transverse isotropy, but we allow it to happen. And uh, that gives us five uh, free parameters. So we have 2.1 million nodes and five free parameters at every point, so about 10 million free parameters. Um, there are several other modeling elements that go in a spiral. I don't have a lot of time to go into these in any, any detail. They've been uh, well documented through several papers that we've written. Uh, they include the multiple uh, phase look, multiple event relocation uh, process, which basically treats every event as an event cluster and uses a multiple event relocation process and, and determines all of the parameters that are involved in the location, including. Uh, uh, the location itself, line, depth, time, and the actual phase is part of the, uh, is part of the uh, Monte Carlo Monte chain uh, process as well. We also use 3D ray tracing. It's a custom technique that we developed that works directly with our parameterizations, and we documented this well um, several times. Um, and the reason we have to use 3D ray tracing, usually, uh, you don't need to use 3D ray tracing for teleseismic phases. To, uh, it's just not that much perturbation of usual. But at the regional scale, as you can see in the figure on the right here, this is an example for an event in Japan recorded at fictitious stations just for illustration purposes on the mainland. And you can see the difference between 1D and 3D paths. They're quite dramatic. So if you're going to get regional scale details, travel times, you should use a 3D ray tracing. And it also includes multipathing, which I'm not showing here, but you can actually include paths that come in at about the same time to, uh, to broaden out the sensitivity. 
Uh, the other element that's uh, important here is uh, the progressive multi-level tessellation uh, inversion process. And basically what this does is it takes advantage of the hierarchical grid of the critical tessellations, solves for a model uh, at a very coarse level, and then progresses through the spherical tessellation until it gets down to the final tessellation that you consider. So it's a, it's a very data-driven way of creating a multi-resolution model. So if the data don't need these details, uh, they don't produce those details. Uh, so it's a, a way to, to, to create the multi-resolution multi, uh, uh, multi type model without determining what, what uh, you know, without going straight to the highest resolution that you want to and without using any smooth, any smooth operators. Uh, so, with all of these elements, we create the multi resolution model of VPV, VPH, VSV, VSH, data, which is the that, that accounts for the arbitrary um, travel directions of uh, body waves uh, from the surface to the core. So, that in a nutshell is a spiral model. And now, here are some examples of the spiral model. Uh, compared to uh, three other models, including our uh, previous joint PS model, JPS. So spirals here, and that column, JPS is here, and the SPN here, and this is a joint PS circuit model. And then a, a Texas model, which is a joint PS uh, flight model. Uh, what we notice here with the VS, um, isotropic VS, is that Obviously, we get a lot more intensity in the spiral model compared to our previous model, and a lot more character in the oceans uh, in the shallow part. And that's not surprising because now we're using surface waves too. So we uh, can see uh, anomalies out there. We also see the patterns are very similar to SPN, uh, except a lot of more detail in the spiral model. And we also see a lot more detail in the spiral model as we go with depth than other models typically. But the patterns are overall the same. If you smooth it, it will improve a lot like these uh, other models. Um, but it doesn't change dramatically from our joint PS model because we're using the same body weight uh, travel type data. Another real interesting part of this model is the P wave velocities. Again, these are the same models for comparison. We, of course, again, in the shallow oceans, we see a lot, a lot of new variations there and very low velocity. Uh, P wave anomalies near the East Pacific rise. Um, but what you'll notice is that it's asymmetric. So it's actually the shifted off of the East Pacific rise. And uh, it's something interesting, something to try to figure out why why that exists exactly. Um, but I will note that this SP any model, um, they, they created a test model where they allowed the P wave and S wave velocity uh, variations to. Um, to separate, and in that test model, they got something very similar to what we see. And then they decided, well, let's just couple them and make them, uh, and, and force, force the S and B to look much more black. And so we chose the other path, say, well, we'll, we'll give it a loose split friction on P and S uh, velocities and try to make them map out the same way. Uh, but it's a looser restriction. And this is a nonlinear process. So each time it just got further and further and further away from what's mapped together. So which depth range are you talking about? I see it's 500 kilometers here, but I'm talking about this here at 100 kilometers depth. Oh, at 100 kilometers. Really shallow of the mantle. Now, it, there's definitely some considerations here that need to be made. The only thing that's constraining that though, are, are railway waves. That's it. As there is, there's not much body weight information that's traveling through the shallow mantle of the, the oceans. And really, waves are only somewhat since the heat wave velocity. So I would take it with a grain of salt, but I would also point out that they got something similar when they allowed it. They allowed that key uh, has to relax. And I'm not yeah. sure uh, exactly what it means. There's something that somebody should. But if mention. you look at Q models, they're also asymmetric. It's asymmetric like that. Oh, well, wow. okay. So in terms of the anisotropy, um, here are the main observations. P wave anisotropy is much, much weaker than, than S. Uh, SH is typically faster than SV above 250 kilometers. It's an expected result. 
probably due to lattice proposal orientation and, and uh, mineral uniform flow. And SH is slight, uh, typically slightly lower than SV from 350 to 400. It's not a big signal, but it's there. So your hair drops off. If that's meaningful, I'm not sure, but um, it's there. It's pretty, um, pretty clear, but small. Uh, the mean anisotropy values are consistent with prior models, and I'm kind of demonstrating that on the right. Uh, if you look at several curves of, of other models, compared to spirals, spirals in black, sort of thick black line, that's the mean model. Um, but the variations, plus or minus two standard deviations, are shown in the gray. So the point is, is that, yes, the mean model is pretty similar to what we've seen before, but there's a lot of variation. So that's, that's the main point of that. Okay, so um, so that, that's the spiral model. And uh, there's a lot more we can, we can talk about there, but I kind of want to move on a little bit from spiral. Uh, we have a new multi-lab initiative uh, that uh, uh, emphasizes waveform prediction. It's called waveforms. Um, this is a tri-lab project with Los Alamos and Sandia and Livermore. And there are a lot of things happening here. Each of these line items here is a different task uh, that's in this project. So we've got a lot going on. Uh, one thing that's going on is global waveform inversion. That's uh, that's the area that I'm, I'm focused on. And it uh, we, we're using Spiral as a starting model. Okay, so the first stage was to integrate uh, Spiral into Spectrum 3D Globe. And uh, this is something that we we just had a conversation about. Um, we 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 did this very carefully. We developed codes in Fortran that are part of the Spectrum package to properly translate our spiral model. So we have multi-resolution type sampling where we have the high resolution zones and bands, and we have flattening of the model to take care of the undulations in the sampling scheme, but then in the uh, codes that are in spectrum, it reintroduces those. So it creates the spectral elements and then stretches to, to conform to the spiral model. So, um, and this is available to everybody as part of the, the spectrum low package. Um, so this gets back to the simulation that I showed earlier. Um, and, and it brings up the question, is spiral a reasonable starting model for uh, adjoint away from commodity? And I, I can say yes already, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to demonstrate and show that. Uh, so this is a simulation of the uh, 2005 Keshul event using spiral. And this is a snapshot at eight minutes. And on the right is, are the recordings at uh, Turkmenistan. So this is a, uh, just up, just north, just north from the event. Um, and we can see in the 20 to 50 second period band here of uh, the cytograms comparing spiral to the data, spiral shown in red. It does fairly well. So what's the distance? Sorry. What's that? The distance. The distance of oh, Turkmenistan. Trying to remember. It's like a thousand kilometers. 1200, yeah, 1200, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. Um, so, it does pretty well in this case, right? For a travel time model. So the travel time model is not a way to this model. But it's, it's really not enough to, to really convince anybody that, that it's a good starting point. Um, so what we did, we did a pilot study when we wrote the spiral model. As part of that, uh, that paper, we did uh, simulations to compare spiral waveform predictions to other models in three key regions. Um, so in the Western US, we looked at the Wells Nevada earthquake from 2008, which had the, the big deployment of US array, so lots of samples. Um, the 2005 Keshnam Island event that I mentioned earlier, and the DPRK test, the, the large nuclear test, the fire nuclear test, uh, and North Korea. North Korea. Um, we tested this against, uh, uh, for, for the Western US, against a hybrid model. And include an ambient noise uh, model, US 2016 in the crust, and then one of uh, the Berkeley models uh, and the mantle. So you didn't use the crust of the of our model? I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Um, so the just pointing this out because yeah. you know mantle and crust go together. Yeah. It does, but yeah, yeah, as I as I mentioned before, as I mentioned before, that um, there was a there was a study by uh, Min Chen that said that or in, in their their group that uh, that was really the starting point for the Western West. So that's why we Okay. Uh, yeah. So, and we and for the uh, Middle East, uh, for the Cashin Island, we we compared it to the S two point nine EA model, which is one of the Harvard models, and um, it's a it's a global model, but it has uh, tighter spacing throughout Eurasia, so as a Eurasian focus. And it does have some long period waveform uh, fitting going on in that with waveform modeling going on in, in that model too. So we thought it was a good model at this point. I, I, I might use a different model now, but that's what we did. Um, and for the DPRK test, we used the uh, Texas model FWEA18 by Tau, uh, which is a waveform uh, inversion uh, model for that region. Um, so, visual inspection of these seismogram and synthetic suggest spiral form performs well as the other models overall. So, you would have to look at all of them to, to come to that same conclusion, which is there's just too many to look at. Uh, but another point I want to make is um, in, in this example here, if we look at station E and H for the DPRK uh, test, we see that uh, in the 20 to 50 second period band, for this case, viral does better. And this is a little bit cherry picking because you can find cases where the other model does better. You see this quite often. Um, but what I really want to point out here is that in that 10 to 20 second period band, the models are terrible. And we all, a lot of people in here would already expect that. And they do, and we show that there. But this is that 21. How do you do that? <laughs> How did that happen? Um, so this is at 2,100 kilometers away, and so that that's a that, that's that would be hard to actually know. Um, in the 20 second period, uh, if it was when you look at spiral out uh, much closer to Japan, uh, so between about 800,000 kilometers away, see that 10 to 20 second period man, is, is not terrible. So it's actually thousand kilometers away to Japan, um, surprising a little bit at how well it actually feels, but. It's not always gonna. It's not always gonna do that. But I was surprised by this, so I wanted to show it. Now I should also mention. Let me go back. I should also mention uh, why am I looking at twenty to fifty second period band and ten to twenty second period. Uh, these are important period bands for us for a moment tensor inversion. Which twenty to fifty second can be a, a really good period band to use. Uh, but the ten to twenty is really. Uh, what we're interested in too for smaller events, smaller events that don't produce really great 20 to 50 or, or, or longer period of energy. So these are important period bands for us. That's why, that's why we're looking at those. Um, so instead of uh, this full visual inspection and throwing thousands of seismograms at you, um, we also wanted to try to quantify this fit and of how well these models uh, compare how they compare. And so we used the PyFlex uh, window selection tool. And this is a stage in adjoint tomography that's often used to window uh, seismograms where the synthetic and the data are similar enough uh, based on some criteria. Um, those criteria are mainly co co correlation coefficients between the two, time shifts, amplitude differences, but also uh, minimum window is one in the window to create a network of sorts and so calculate a mystery of variety. Um, the number of windows found in this is a key performance metric, as well as all the other metrics. Saw me coming. I didn't touch it. Okay. Uh, so we can we can plot up all the window statistics here, and I'm showing an example for Wells in Nevada. 20 to 50 second period down on the left, then the 20 second period down on the right. Spiral on the top, the hybrid model uh, in the middle, the three hybrid model, and AK135. But in the 20 to 50 second period, then we see that for spiral, we find more windows in, the point in, that, in that band. 
Um, this, this is the correlation coefficient. These are the time shifts of each of the windows, the time shift that's needed to get the highest correlation. So where do we, where is the best? In the middle of the plot? I mean, well, we can't read, I can't read okay. the numbers. Well, so this is the number of windows, 243. Okay. More windows are spiral than the smaller. Right. And then but what about the histograms? Where are we supposed to be? The time shifts in the, in the waveform model. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. For that period of time. And AK135 finds the same number of windows, but the time shifts to one. Um, now, if we look at the 10 to 20 second period then with spiral, we find 622 windows. The other three model, 415. So spiral actually finds a lot more windows. Um, and you can debate about what the, the um, um, distributions look like. But I can argue that, uh, I think I can argue that, that these models, if we look at this period band and that period band collectively, are pretty, pretty similar in terms of their performance. So and, AK, AK-135 is a 1D model? Yes, and that's what I was going to say next. Okay. Yes, <laughs> they beat me to it. Um, so what, what's surprising here is that AK-135 in the 10 to 20 second period band actually works really well. So it's about so well, that's because it's a, it's the continental model, right? Exactly. AK exactly. Well, it doesn't always perform that one, but yeah. Sorry. Okay, so moving on to the, the cash on event, uh, we see 584 uh, in the 450 second male spiral for the other 3D model, 485, so more of a spiral. But again, the time shifts do look a little better here uh, for sure. Uh, the amplitudes look a little bit better in spiral for what it's worth. Um, and both models perform better than, than AK 135. In this period of band, uh, spiral finds 384 windows and 455 are found on the other three models. So I would say this band, the other models are better. Um, but collectively, I would say it's a, a bit of a walk. It's kind of a mixed, mixed result in my opinion, just because um, it's, it's found 100 more windows. Not incredibly difficult, but uh, I feel that the, these are on par. I mean, the three models are on par with each other. Um, so the final one, uh, DPRK uh, event with the uh, current spiral full waveform inversion model uh, of that, that region. Okay, 35 again. Spiral finds 271 windows. The waveform model finds 234. And I would say the uh, window statistics are, are pretty similar. I don't see a major difference between the two. Both of them do have a time shift to the negative. Uh, but they're very similar. Only 78 uh, found that they gave them 35, so it doesn't perform well at all uh, in that case. And again, right, it's not all continental pass. Uh, so in the 10 to 20 second, Spiral just finds 214, and the time shifts are actually really good. And this is kind of what you saw with those past to Japan. Actually, that's pretty, pretty well uh, for that case. And it is biased to Japan because we have a lot of stations there. I keep that in mind. Uh, but still, it finds more windows than the waveform based model. So I would say, uh, again, a bit of a wash. I wouldn't say. Based on this, that either uh, one of these uh, trading models, trading models are. Excuse me, if, uh, if I may interrupt. Yep. So the Sorry. the travel time histogram is much more centered in this plot than it was in any other plot. Yes. Does that mean that the fact that the source location and origin time are very well constrained in this case? They are all. I was no. I would say they all mm -hmm. are. For these three events, they are they are well located. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't I don't think that's the issue. Um, I, I, coincidence, happenstance. I don't know. I don't know how to how to put it. Mm -hmm. Again, this is just one of them. You know. So this was just a, a question. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm wondering. So your model is with travel times, and this and uh, the other models are with uh, full waveforms. So wouldn't we expect? Uh, your model to have much better travel time fit and not quite as good uh, cross correlation with uh, for the waveforms, but, but 
and 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 the opposite for full weight for models, but it doesn't seem like that's what's happening. Do you do you know why? I, that's a very good question. I and mean, when you're uh, uh, looking at waveforms, full wheels, when you're doing cross correlation, those shifts aren't necessarily the same as the onset times. Yeah, right? travel times onset, and that's not necessarily what you're mapping here when you're doing the cross correlation and, and shifting the yes. wave. That's that's part of the, that. Yes. Is that answered or? Uh, no, I'm I'm wondering. I mean, you, you, your models basically minimize the time shift, and yeah. and the other models minimize the cross correlation, or maximize the cross correlation, and though and still it doesn't look like your model gets better time shift or the other models get better cross correlations. So that's yeah, I find that really surprising. Yeah, I um, I would say I, I wouldn't worry too much about the cross correlations because all I'm saying here is um, that they have to meet some minimum threshold in this point. In this case, 0. 0.75, 75 to 0.95. But the times are, like I'd say, more important. The amplitudes are very important um, as well. And the spiral is arguably better. But this is 50 versus 25, so the distribution is pretty good. Uh, again, there's some bias to Japan. Spiral app, apples do well to be better. So uh, if you look at another event, a little bit on land, you might get a different answer. You might get different distributions. So um, it, it can vary quite wildly. <laughs> I don't know if I got to your question. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Okay. And distract myself. Okay. okay. So uh, a lot of you are familiar with this too. Um, this this provides a little uh, more evidence that spiral actually does really well. Uh, and uh, so this, this is a uh, project that Marty Rogers led uh, to generate a Western US model using that uh, tomography. And um, so use spiral as a starting model and demonstrate why uh, that, that, that's not a, a, a bad decision. Um, the, the validation demonstrated that spiral performed better than most models tested. And that includes the US 22 adjoint model. And this kind of this is demonstrated that here as you're looking at different um, events. So these are validation events here, events that were not in the version. Uh, so basically misfit reduction, we want that to be very high. Uh, the Western US model falls along the screen line and it's sorted by this sorted by that. Uh, these are other models compared to spiral. So anything below this fits, does not fit as well as spiral. And these are the averages. And what we find is that typically the models, the other models don't fit as well as spiral. But I say that the CSIM models, and this is a CSIM North America waveform model, it's, I'd say, on par. It's like, right. very similar. And then the ambient noise models do perform pretty good. So it provides more evidence that, at least continentally, the Western US that um, Spiral are actually uh, doing well now. So, you know, this now brings us to, since I think we have enough evidence that it's a reasonable starting model for waveform conversion. Uh, we started developing an initial waveform data set. Uh, we initially looked at the DMG uh, catalog and we limited the uh, magnitude down to 5.8 to 6.8. So, any events that we're considering is for large event data set. We're going to develop more data sets as we go. Uh, and we, we limited it to 5.8 to 6.8 because below 5.8, you don't get necessarily the best signal at the furthest distances. Above 6.8, you have uh, finite faulting issues, large events, long durations, and you don't want to treat those as a test on sources. So, and there's plenty of events to choose from. So, 5.8 to 6.8 gives us uh, uh, 4,500 events plotted here. And we also uh, down selected to events only after 1996. And that's because the number of stations 
in the uh, Iris catalog and the Iris database since the drop prior to that. In further down selection, uh, what we did, we started the last event in 2021, took every event going backwards in time that fell uh, beyond one degree from any other event. So it guarantees that there's one degree space in between any event. And we also did this in different depth events to make sure that we had uh, deep events as well. And so that took it down to 1,198 events. Now, Okay, so this is the original data set with that first down selection. This is after, and then you can really tell the difference. So basically, a lot of the repeated events. Okay, so this is this is the distribution of events by year since I started in uh, 2021 and started stepping back. I have a lot more events in, in the last 12 years or so than, than prior. Um, but it's important to keep all of these events here prior to the 2000s to, to fill event gaps. So events back with the time sometimes will occur where there's no other events and you want to try to get this in there. Um, and the station configuration is changing. So we like to have a, a broad range of, of years uh, uh, of events instead of just focusing on the most recent one you get, you know, uh, you can get 1200 events easily. Um, you need to look at, uh, consider different station configurations, and this demonstrates that within that 2021, a random event from that down selection, see the station configuration there, five years prior, five years prior, and so on. And you see the configuration of stations change, so that, that's, that's the make change. How do you decide what stations to include? Is it just what stations are available at IRIS, or? Yes. Okay. Yep. So it's, it's yes. no consideration of noise. No. No. Okay, so to kind of I can kind of summarize uh with the data set, we have nine nine seven hundred stations roughly uh and two hundred and forty one networks and I I plotted the networks uh the color color coded the networks so sorry, can I yeah. ask another related question? So you don't go, you know, there are, you don't go and pursue data sets, regional data sets from other regional networks in, in you know, interesting locations, different countries, yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot already here. It's, yeah, a lot of these yeah. are temporary. But the, right, but this is, all from, this is just what's at Iris. Right. I'm sort of asking the question is that obviously it's a lot more work to go and get those additional stations, and so. It's a trade off. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. But so right now, you just take what you see. That's right. Yeah. And uh, the, the intention is later on to build um, special event sets, special station sets, and, and uh, a separate data right. Yeah. So this is just the first large event data set. I think I'd be right. I'd be right. I'll go ahead and do it now. And so to give some raw statistics again for the state events. Uh, the average number of stations per event is about 148, so that's uh, uh, quite a bit. And this data set that we built is about 1.1 terabytes. Um, so it's a quite a bit of data to, to consider all at once. Um, so you know, as others have done, we're thinking about taking a stage approach to the inversion instead of trying to invert all 1,198 events with an average of 1,100 stations each. We're going to take a staged approach. First of all, in phase one, we plan on fitting four, 40 to 200 second period waves, three to five iterations per event set. So each event set, we're going to start with 100 to 200 events, and then update the model, and then move on to the next set. That's the intent right now. And use the average gradient between the two. So you take the average gradient at the last step of the ad joint commodity. Uh, of the previous set and incorporated in the first gradient of the second set. So basically you're you're overlapping a little bit there. So that's the plan right now. So to get 100 to 200 event sets, now we have to kind of select from that 1198 and grouping events by month, spanning all years. Since there's 1200 events, um, take all the January events and so on, get about 100 events in each of those. 
So it's spanning all years and station configurations and, and ran. So uh, we're thinking about taking January or January, February sets. We're going to test that, figure out what we need to do, how many events we actually need to, to consider. Uh, but I can tell you in a set of 100 events here, you know, there's, there's around 300,000 size grants to consider. So it gets me pretty quick. Um, so each set here, you know, bi monthly, is a good representative cross section of the data set and a convenient size for, for what we're what we're considering in, in each events to go there in the set stage. Uh, so we've been working on uh, workflow for the adjoint waypoint market problem for the global problem. Um, we first took the uh, size flows workflow from by Mondrick at all, which kind of worked out this problem. You know, you know mostly. Uh, but the problem, there, there, there are several things that were not there, so we have to update it. Uh, but the big issue here is that it's really more suitable for smaller problems than this. Um, so we, we've gone to a more uh, semi-automated semi process uh, where we basically deconstructed what was inside flows, added all of our changes, made up all, all of our additions. Uh, that's because we ran into I.O. and wall time issues with the uh, supercomputers. Like I said, there was about 300,000 uh, events in, in 100 split set, so a lot. Uh, we're, we're calculating 100 or four and a hour long time series, and for each uh, each of these iterations, for each forward simulation, we're requesting 21,000 CPUs. You can imagine we've got a lot of uh, a lot of things happening, a lot of potential for failure, and we found a lot of failures. So we basically had to go to a more semi-automated process. Uh, so this is a description so, uh, of the semi-automated process. And Christina Morrency, uh, who you guys uh, talked to a few weeks ago, uh, has been developing with me. Um, she's been reading it. And she's created all of these modules that you can better and better for the adjoint uh, possible. Uh, it has multiple checks, and we start with this. Python based uses spectrum below as the interface is with spectrum three below. Uh, launching large uh, slurm batch jobs on, on two of our computers right now. And we've run the first full scale test just to see that we actually can get to the work. And we have. This is an illustration of that first iteration. Uh, so this is the spiral model on the left, first gradient, and the updated model. I think we have some tweaks to make to the gradient. Um, in terms of uh, different regularization. But our first test here was just to make sure that we can get to this workflow. Then we'll now we can get tweaks. And once we do that, then we can start scaling this stuff. And, and this is a VSV at 127 kilometers deep. By the way, the inversion is also VSV, VSH, BBB, and A. It's just like a lot So five for that. Um, so to conclude, um, we continue to make process with global tomography uh, a little bit more. You know, we've gone from a very long wavelength, there was a model down to the spiral model, which is a multi resolution travel time based model. Uh, I think it performs spiral performs surprisingly well for a travel time model predicting waveforms. And there might be other travel time models out there that do the same. I honestly don't know. Uh, but it, it surprised me a bit of how well it did some, at least the continental readers that were tested. Um, so it can serve as a starting line. There's a block in there. And uh, we're in the early, early stages of the semi automated uh, adjunct uh, monitoring process that we're going uh, to continue to work on it and launch this, this next year. I think that's all I had. Yes. Extra slide. Okay, thank you, Nathan. So we're open for questions. I think Dorian has a question to begin with. Yes. Yes, in your in your workflow 